go. All right. Good morning. This is the first day of class. Um, January 17th. Twenty eighteen. How that works. Document camera. Oh, that's my hand. Not a good job. They really messed with this. Okay, that's today. Yay. English thirteen oh two. Okay. I'm gonna leave it up there. Good morning, Ms. Thompson. Hey there. I'm assuming everybody's called today and your wall's looking good. Wait, that's Laugh Buddy. Why are we on Laugh Buddy? Okay. I got to get them out of the group here. They're not supposed to be there here this semester. Lorenzo, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Um, I don't know why it's not, the camera's not flipping over to you guys. It's stuck on last buddy who's not going to be with us this, this semester. Um, Woman Union, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. Awesome. Well, it cut back to last buddy. Damn it. Um, I'm trying to get them out of the connection. It might take a minute. So, Wellman Union's there. Lorenzo's there. Crossington's there. Whitherall, are you there? They may not be. Um, I haven't seen anybody from Whitherall registered for the class, so. So, and it looks like we've lost a couple of people. 
probably to too many activities in the spring. So, hey, I know it's cold where everybody's at. It's actually kind of warm in this room. I have one SVC student who hasn't made it here yet, and I actually taught her last semester in a face-to-face -face class, so that's kind of cool. But we got a lot to cover today because we have to make up for not having Monday, for y'all not having to go to school on Monday. So I'm going to throw up real quick as the syllabus, uh, but first things first, here's what the textbook looks like. It's blue, kind of heavy, full of reading. And we're not going to do all of it. We're not even probably going to do a tenth of it, but we are going to be reading a lot of stuff. It's Del, uh, Del Bianco and Chus. And it has the tree on it, and it looks like birds are pulling the tree up into the air, the tree of knowledge. We're, we're going to be talking about that a little bit today. Um, be sure if you buy it, don't get, don't get it with Connect. Your Connect code from last semester should be good for this semester. And we'll see that we've got that in the syllabus, okay? Which um, hopefully your facilitators got your copies of. So I'm going to flip over to real quick, all right? So everything has stayed the same except my office hours are a little bit different. Um, I will be in my office from 10 to 1. This is a little unusual. Normally in the spring I have a, a 1 o'clock class on Mondays and Wednesdays out here at SPC, so I, I just have a lot of my hours then. So I'll, I go, when I leave here, I go over to my office and I stay there for three hours and then I teach at 1 o'clock. And then Friday, was that at one of the schools or was that here? That's interesting. Okay. Well, there's a bell. And then on Friday from 9 to 11, so if you need to get in touch with me, you can. Basically, this is 1301, but it, it's not 1301. It is literature-centered, and we'll do some writing about literature, but there are, you really only have to write two things, uh, two major documents. One's going to be a character analysis, and the other is a research paper over Hamlet. We're going to do a poetry project that is a little more your centered about, oh, there you guys are. Awesome. It's good to see y'all. Looking good. Okay. We still have last buddy, but, you know, at least I can see everybody. That's good. Um, but so we'll do a poetry project, which allows you to do a little exploring in the textbook, okay? Um, so the, uh, this down over here on the syllabus, this next section is just giving you the definite information from about the textbook. The requirements say we read numerous short stories, poems, and uh, dramas. We're actually only going to read two plays. One of them is extremely short. It's called Trifles. The other one's a bit longer, and it's Hamlet. And just as a heads up, because I know the semester, things start just compiling, particularly when you're in a smaller school, because everybody does everything. I get that. Um, so that when we, I save drama for the end of the semester, because really we're going to spend four weeks on Hamlet, and that's the last four weeks of the semester. And part of that's writing the research paper. So it's kind of, I try to not overwhelm you. We do most of our work right now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not, it's a lot more relaxed than writing a paper every two, two and a half weeks. Okay? Uh, so, let's see. Um, it's, and it's one of the requirements, one of the points on there says that there may be major examinations. I do not give multiple choice tests, except for the final exam this semester. So that's just a heads up. Um, and that will be over Hamlet, because that's the last thing we're doing. Uh, but once again, we're going to have the librarian come in and focus on how to do research specifically on um, Hamlet, and so not necessarily on topical issues. So here's a great breakdown. It's a little bit different from last semester where we had all those dadgum papers. Dadgum. That's an old Texas word, isn't it? There's going to be a literary terms quiz. The literary terms quiz, right as a heads up right now, will be next Wednesday. It's a week from today. It's 10% of your grade. You need to study for it. It will, you will take it on the computer, um, probably, uh, I'll double, we'll double check, check the date. I may actually have set it up for Thursday, but I think I've allowed enough time to do it at the end of the class on Wednesday. There will be reading quizzes. If I don't give quizzes, you won't read it before class. So, like, if the very first time we have a reading assignment and I can tell nobody's read it, then you'll start seeing that we'll have class, uh, quizzes at the beginning. Um, and that'll, I'll explain that a little bit more when we look at the schedule. You can see there's a short story character analysis, and I'm missing the last half of the parentheses. It's worth 150 points. The poetry project's 150. The research paper's the only thing I'm going to ask you to do a draft on, because if we do that, then I think your papers will be better. Um, so you can see the essay's worth 150, but draft, 50 points for the draft and revision, so that's very important. Um, there are only 100 points to connect this time. Uh, because um, 
I just chose to make it worth just a little bit less, and then the final exam. And it's the same grade breakdown for 900 to 1,000 and so on. Don't worry about the absence and performance policy. It doesn't apply to you guys, except for assignments. They must be turned in on time. If I'll take stuff up to three days late, and after that, I will not take it. And I'll take off 10 points for every day it's late, okay? Um, this is an error right here where you see the study participation section. Just take your pencil and cross it off. It is not a problem. I do daily participation a lot for the face-to-face -face students because they have a hard time getting their butts up here to school sometimes. And so if I make, and also it ensures they get here to take those quizzes when we have them, okay? Um, so that's what's going on. Like I'm gonna have to get on Kylie for not being here, so. Um, classroom decorum, I don't have a problem. You guys behave, except for every once in a while. I have a feeling your phones take a lot more attention than I do. And we already know that it's hard to pay attention to a woman who's sitting on the TV. I get that, okay? Uh, but when we're doing a lot of this, it's going to be, you're going to be, I'm going to ask you questions about stuff that you read, kind of like what we did with the, the uh, professional essays that we analyzed last semester. We're going to be doing some stuff like that, where I'd rather we talked about the literature versus I talked about it all the time. Uh, plagiarism, and plagiarism and cheating, it's the same policy. If you give me something that's written by somebody else, you're going to find yourself in trouble. I will probably give you an F on the assignment or a zero on the assignment, and I can I also have the right to kick you out of the class, so be careful. Don't do it. Um, and that's one thing I've got to go do is I've got to go, I have my stuff being turned in, not through turn it in, but I'm going to do that just because it's together. And that's all the examples. Cheating, students with disabilities, none of this has changed. Statement of non-discrimination, statement of diversity. Um, when it comes to literature, there's not necessarily one meaning for when you read fiction. Let me phrase it that way. Um, Nonfiction, when you're talking about reading an essay somebody's written, some of that's not quite as open to as much interpretation. But with literature, there can be multiple interpretations. If you can back up what you're saying, that's perfectly acceptable, all right? Uh, but you, have, you can't say that this is about a monkey eating bananas and there's never a monkey mentioned in it. So there's got to be some kind of relationship between what you're saying and what's in the text. But so long as you can prove that. Or if you misread a text, like poetry, sometimes we can misread poetry. Anybody out there like poetry? No hands? Hopefully after we do some work with it, that might help you enjoy it a little bit more. I love it, but then I've had to read it a lot more for a lot of years. Okay. Um, here is the schedule. You can see we've got a lot of things to cover today. There's the welcome, which the nice thing is since I had you all last semester, except we have one new student from what I know. Um, the overview of the syllabus, we're going to talk literary terms and the symbolism PowerPoint. And there is a literary terms, power, a literary terms PowerPoint that I didn't have it on there. But you can see it's pretty explicit. So when you look at next week, on the, and I give you till next week to get the textbook, but, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Uh, there's some reading out of the textbook. We're reading a story for its elements. There's a couple of pages. And then there's two items to read, A Rose for Emily by Faulkner and Hills Like White Elephants by Hemingway. Sometimes I realize if you order your book from the Internet, it may not get in. Not everybody has Prime like I do. Uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm like a Prime plus, plus plus. Both of those stories, A Rose for Miss Emily, it's by Faulkner, and Hills Like White Elephants are by Hemingway. Both should be available online. You should be able to find them online if you don't have your textbook in time to get it read by next Monday, okay? And that's acceptable. Um, but you really need the textbook to be able to do the class. And if you're sharing with someone, make sure that you get equal sharing. Or, you know, it's not my fault if you share a text. That's something you have to work out with somebody. But make sure, you know, be sure you get your turn with it. I think I had that happen last year. Somebody was borrowing, sharing a text with somebody else, and the other person never let them have it. So when you see this date, 122, you're supposed to have read all those sections. So the main thing to focus on is having read the two stories, A Rose from Miss Emily and Hills Like White Elephants. They're not terribly long. Um, when I was in grad school, or actually just in an un taking an undergrad English class to get certified, I had a teacher who thought short stories were 160 pages or less. Um, I don't give you anything near that long. I think the longest we have might be, oh gosh, eight pages at the most. Because I, I understand that you're not, the longer they get, the less likely you are to read them. The more likely you are to go and Google a rose from assembly and see what somebody else had to say about it. So be careful about re getting a summary, though, because it may not always give you that stuff. Okay. All right. She tells me she got them out. Good. 
Okay, let's go back over here. You can see as it goes through the literary terms quiz, I have it set up for Friday, so that works out to your advantage. You need to take it. I'm only going to open it up for your class period, so you must take it between 8 and 9 a.m. on Friday. There shouldn't be, is there, we're not starting the stock shows. Nobody's leaving for stock shows yet, are they? So next Friday, the 26th is okay for that quiz? Or do I need to, would it be better to do it on Tuesday? I mean Thursday. Everybody's okay with Friday the 26th for the literary terms quiz. Again, it'll only be open for that hour, and you don't get to use your notes. It's a fill in the blank, and we're going to flip over to that right now. You should have a list of literary terms. Um, let me find it. Oh, that's not it. Looks like this. It's just a long sheet of paper. Good morning, Kylie. Good morning. We're going. We've already gone over the syllabus. All your documents are right there. Okay. okay. So here's the list of terms. I'm not leaving you blind. And we have a quiz next Friday. That you, I just put your stuff up here. It's just you're the only one, so. Really? Yeah. Well, not counting the three schools up there. Okay. So the left-hand corner is Wellman Union, where you see the red dot. The right hand, top right hand, is Crosbyton, and that is Lorenzo down below. Okay. Oh, and this is Kylie. Okay. So she knows me since we had each other last semester. Yeah, ah, that works like that. Okay. All right. So with the, um, there is a PowerPoint in your in the in the Blackboard. I can't even get the words out. In Blackboard, in Introduction Week One. Okay. And in that, it has almost all of the definitions for the literary terms quiz. Wasn't that nice of me? I didn't send it to the facilitators because I forgot I had it in there. But here it is, literary terms. It says game, but I used to do a game with it. But if you go through, you're going to see that on that list, you'll see illusion is the first one. Here's the definition. All you're going to have to do is a fill in the blank. So guess what? It's probably going to be blank is a brief and indirect reference to a person, place, thing, or idea of historical, cultural, literary, or political significance. That's probably what you're going to see on the test. And all you have to do is fill in the blank. There will be a word bank, but there's like 20 of these words. So some of them get a little confusing. Yeah, there's 20 words. I was just doing a quick count there <laughs> so we know. And the other thing I give you is I, these are all examples of allusions, and then it explains what they are. So you're going to see analogy, anaphora, antithesis, cliche, um, euphemism, hyperbole, uh, imagery jargon. The only two you don't have off of that list are slang and symbol. And so my suggestion would be, I'm going to let you guys deal with getting those terms written down. Uh, Kylie's fortunate. I gave you have a copy of the literary oh, terms uh, PowerPoint in yours because I gave it to my face-to-face -face classes. Yeah. Well, the schools have to print theirs. Okay. <laughs> but so slang is. I would suggest for slang, just look it up, Google it. Let's see. Um, and that should be the definition for slang because I think that's what I did because it, I took them right out of the textbook. At the back is a glossary that has all the literary terms in it. Obviously, I'm not using all those literary terms because that would take forever. But slang wasn't in here. And so, nope, slam. Slam is, but not slang. And so all I did was type in slang. And I didn't go to, um, I looked for a, General definition, not one. A, a, well, it says, slang, a type of language that consists of words and phrases that are regarded as very informal or more common in speech than writing and restricted to a particular group of uh, people or a context. That's what slang is. Symbol, we're going to be doing a symbol, symbolism PowerPoint in about <coughs> three or four minutes. I'm going to start that. Okay. Yeah, but it, but if you look, if, no, there's, there should be one more page that has. Some of them are, some of the slides are out of order. Okay. So, but they should all be in there, okay? But it's going to be fill in the blank, and there should be a word bank available. On that quiz, if you misspell the word, it will count it wrong because it grades the quiz. I don't. So if you don't know how to spell cliche and you leave off the little accent at the end, it will count it wrong. Don't panic. I will go in and check for that. It's amazing how people will spell simile smile, and I know you mean simile, okay? So I will check out those things, so don't panic. So now, here's the big one. We've got to do, pow We've got to do symbolism because you need to know what symbolism is when you're talking about literature, when you're talking about movies. Um, 
it just it's in, it's one of those things that determines so much about what's going on. Um, so you have an outline version of the you should have an outline version of the PowerPoint over symbolism. I, it's all it's all little bitty. Okay, yeah, okay. It's got a lot of blank stuff on it. So you might want to take some notes, okay? And I, one of the things I'm symbolism symbols bring to mind things that are very important to the human psyche. Does that make sense? So um, let me let me just start on it. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to phrase this. Okay. So here's symbolism. Um, they're archetypal images. It's these things that inherently uh, we seem to recognize. They call them the archetypes of human personality. I don't know necessarily human personality is the best thing to call it, but um, there are those things that we tend to recognize on an instinctive level, and we kind of inherit them. Uh, there are patterns that we recognize, and they're in human behavior. There are emotions, our fantasies, and our ideas. So, uh, and a lot of times when I'm talking literature, I will talk about certain types of stories, okay, just because some, some types tend to have a little more symbolism in than others. And so we need to watch for that. Like when you're watching uh, certain movies, like the new, like, I'm going to refer to older versions. Great Gatsby, I don't know if you've all read it, but did you all see the newer version of it? Um, and I like that version because it makes the book much more exciting in one sense because it's hard to, to grasp the vitality and the enthusiasm and the excitement of what was going on in the Roaring, the roaring it was called the Roaring Twenties because it was so different in behavior from what had come previously. But in the book and in the earlier movies, there's this billboard and it's about uh, Dr. T.J. Eckelberg and he's an oculist, which means he's an optometrist. And one of the biggest issues in Gatsby is that people don't see clearly. They, don't, they look at other people and they don't really see them for the, who they are. Gatsby never sees Daisy for who she has become in the five years since they knew each other. Um, they just, and people don't see each other. And that's one of those things you have to watch for. And that's what symbols kind of give us. If you see somebody, if they're constantly showing close up of people's eyes, are they seeing clearly? Um, do you ever have dreams? I have dreams where I'm trying to put my contacts in so I can get to work, and my contacts are like this big. And so I have to fold them down and put them in my eye because that's how I see clearly is by putting contacts on. I don't think about glasses. I think about my contacts. I've worn contacts, you know, like three times longer than you guys have been alive. I, I got contacts when I was 12 years old, so I've had them for almost, well, 50 years. Oh, Lord, that's a long time. Okay. It's, it's depressing to say things like that. And so there are universal patterns, shapes, colors, and events in nature and characters. Okay? Is anybody afraid of the dark? I'm afraid of the dark. I am a big chicken. At night, when, I, you know, when, the, when we're going to bed at night, I get up and I'll go walking into my utility room to check and make sure the garage door is shut. And I do this in the dark. And I know I'm afraid of it. And the, it's dark in the garage and I open the door and I hope there's nobody because I don't want anybody sneaking into my house in the dark. Who's going to get me? And I hope. And I open that door and I peek out real quick and then I shut it and I lock it so that they, I'm too quick for them. They can't, you know. I'm afraid of the dark. Uh, I was traumatized by horror movies as a child, apparently. And so that's just one of those things. Anybody afraid of spiders? All I can think of is poor Ron Weasley. I'm right with him. If you've got an eight-foot spider, it's going to scare the pants off of me. So there are those things that we're inherently we fear. The dark is one of them. So that's maybe one reason why the bad guys wear black. Okay, but there's another there's another reason that deals with that. So these images from nature, these are all important things that we're going to cover. And the the PowerPoint has a lot. We're not going to do absolutely every single slide on this PowerPoint where I get into depth on all the jewels and the numbers. That's crazy. We don't have enough time to do that. But we're going to talk about the major ones. And the first one is water. Out here in Texas, water is life, isn't it? If you don't have water, you can't grow those crops. We don't have any cotton, and we don't have an economy. So water is associated with life. Um, it's precious. It's important. Uh, and it tends to be associated with the female. I don't know why it's associated with the female. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about that. So you've got water. And, and so, you know, it's this good thing until there's too much of it, and then it's a bad thing. 
Too much of anything is considered a negative, by the way. Think about it. Too many energy drinks, you could explode your heart. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those deals. So you have to be, you know, so always think of that single things tend to be better than too many. All right, we'll go back over and we'll talk about, so we're trying to talk about a sea or an ocean. Those are large bodies of water. And have any of you ever been out away, far enough away from the shore so that it felt like you were on the water and there was no land near? Um, we don't have any lakes really big enough in this area to cover that. But large bodies of water, when you go out on them, so I'm going to flip back to me so you can kind of see my, what I'm talking about. Large bodies of water, when you're out on them and, and you're on top of the water, you cannot see very far down because the, what, the depth of the water is so great that you can't see anything. So large bodies of water are, are associated with the unconscious mind. Okay, we're going to talk Freudian psychology right now. Okay, well you have to because remember it's these inherited patterns that we have. Let me flip this up a little bit. I see I got the blue so I could talk about water. So you're out on this. Oh, I'm just looking at what's those. So here's the body of water. Wait, I'll let me draw waves. Okay, and so you're out on the ocean. You're out on the sea. And so you can only see within the first couple of feet. Even you know, even if you think about it, if you're on a lake, sometimes and you're not that far out, you can't see far, very far down because the depth of the water, and then it gets darker, so you can't see. So you can only see in the first few things. So that's why this becomes the unconscious mind. Any place where you cannot see clearly becomes symbolic of the unconscious mind. Because what? remember when all those sailors were sailing from Europe and trying to discover America, what did they draw on their maps? They drew these monsters. They would, you know, when they illustrated all those old maps, you'd see, you know, the, the big images of the large squid or the, you know, I don't know, huge worms and things like that. And so part of what's going on there is any time, we're all in our conscious mind right now, I hope. We're all awake and aware. We know what's going on. So our, our conscious mind, you know, it's out and it's when we're in our unconscious mind is when we're asleep. And when you're asleep, do you dream? I do. I, as a young girl, I saw the original 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea um, by Jules Verne, and it starred Kirk Douglas, and there was this huge monster squid. And it gets a hold of the Nautilus, which is, you know, the first submarine kind of thing, and it's tearing it apart. And so as a child, I would have dreams about that squid, and I was trying to get from one place in the, in the submarine to another place. So that monster in my unconscious mind as a child are all those things those monsters in our lives are the things we cannot control. There are these primal forces of nature, and they lurk in our unconscious mind. Do you ever have dreams that you can fly? I love, I love flying dreams. They're cool. And, you know, you're out there, and you're flying around, and you're so cool, and then things happen. Or have you ever dreamed about monsters? In your, as a, you know. Now, monsters are no, as, as I get older, my monsters are no longer giant octopus or squids. They become harm happening to members of my family. Those are the monsters that scare me. And, but basically what this symbolizes is our unconscious mind. But anytime you are in a place where you cannot see clearly, so being out on the ocean, think about how terrifying that might have been. There's no knowing what all swimming underneath that water. So think about any place where you cannot see clearly, it's the unconscious mind. So that's where our fears, those primal fears come out. Now a river is a little bit different. I mean, the ocean is, co is controlled by the moon and you have the waves and there are currents in it and we don't necessarily see them. But a river starts in one place and ends up in another. So a river is symbolic of a journey. Anybody have ever read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn? Huck gets on a, Huck tries to escape his dad. He's not a very nice guy. And so he runs away and he, gets, he builds a raft with the runaway slave Jim and they float down the Mississippi trying to get Jim to a free state so because he was, he's running away because he thinks he's going to be sold. And so that journey, anything that where you move from one place to another is symbolic of a journey. Whether you get on a plane and travel somewhere, whether you get in a car and travel somewhere, journeys are important because they're about not necessarily about going from one place to the other, but about the changes that occur during the journey to the person taking the journey. So think about any kind of a story where that happens. I'm going to throw in Star Wars. Luke is a young boy. I'm talking about the very first one. Luke is a young man. He's on that desert planet, and he eventually gets in a spaceship, and he flies off into outer space. What is outer space but a bunch of black? It's dark. So the outer space becomes symbolic of the unconscious mind. 
Did that most of you see The Last Jedi? Think about it. How, uh, you didn't see it? Well, now just re- I just want you to realize science fiction is only about setting. The stories are the same. Setting is what makes them different. Whether it's a Western, Christian Bale's got a new Western coming out. Hostile, isn't that what it's called or something? Hostiles, Hostiles or something like that. Um, and so the only difference is he's a good guy fighting bad guys, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think Star Wars is? Good guys fighting bad guys. That's all, all genre is many times is just setting. Okay? So, but rivers are symbolic of journey. So think about Harry Potter. What does he do? He gets on a train and he goes off to Hogwarts. He's on that journey. And as you go through school, you're on a journey. Okay? So your journey in school begins in kindergarten and it ends with one of the most important events in your life, graduation, whether it's high school or college graduation. So those journeys are important, but that's what rivers are. And they're symbolic of movement, so things are not static. Things happen, okay? And then rain. Rain is considered a blessing. It's one of those things that that we consider a blessing, that it's important, that we need it, uh, but it also symbolizes tears. Uh, have you ever watched ER or and how often certain movies begin and it's the weather is rainy or snowy? Symbolic of tears. Think about ER was, you know, a hospital show and how often people in ERs are not, they don't live, bad things happen. So think about what the weather's like when you're talking, when you're looking at a show. Think how often it's rainy, snowy, or it's dark at night. So that's important. Think about all those horror movies. When do they take place? When do the bad things happen? At night, in the dark. It's like when you go see a horror movie, that first person, what always happens to the first person in a horror movie? Well, we know what's going to happen to that first person in a horror movie. What's going to happen to them? They're going to get killed. It's just one of the, it's one of the, uh, I guess, conventions of a horror movie. You kill off the first person. And it happens at night because it's dark. And think how often they're chasing people in the dark. And, you know, how often the girls fall down. White girls can't run in the dark. <laughs> well, they can. Think about how often they get killed because they've fallen down and the, the, the guy in the mask and the hatchet or the axe is killing them. Okay, so... So think about those things. But so rain is blessing, it's tears, it's, they're considered positive things. But again, too much of a good thing, too much of anything is, becomes a negative. All right, so that got us through the first slide. So now we're going to talk about the sun. It's such a happy thing. What metal, M-E-T-A-L, would you associate with the sun? I mean, what color is the sun? Gold. Gold. So gold is the metal that you associate with the sun. Think about it, okay? And so, and when you have, when the sun is out, it's not out right now, is it? It's behind clouds, correct? Okay. So when the sun is out, what do we get from the sun? We get light. We get heat. So the sun is symbolic of light and heat. And so most of the time, the sun is the daytime. So the sun is associated with the conscious mind. Because there's light. You can't, there are, you know, there, the shadows are gone. So it's also associated with the rational. Because when you're, hopefully, when you're awake, you are rational. And with intellect. And it's also associated with the male gender. Okay? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's, and so that's, that's just basically the sun. Now, when you look at the three phases of the sun, and it goes through it every day, even though we don't always see it, dawn is the beginning of the day. Noon is when it's highest, when you have the least amount of, cla- of shadow, and then dusk is as it's going. So if I were going to associate the passage of a day with the human life, dawn would be associated with what part of the human life? which would be, what's the beginning of a human life? It is birth, okay? So dawn is associated with birth. Noon is associated with the prime of life. When you're at your peak, when you're at your zenith, that's a great word to, if you're ever on words with friends and, you need a, and you've got the letters, zenith is a good one to get a lot of points. Um, and then dusk would be associated with what age in life? Dusk is right before nightfall, so dusk is going to be the dying as you get old and you're dying. So nighttime then is associated with 
death. There's a wonderful poem we're going to read. It's called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. It's by Dylan Thomas, and he's writing it to his father as he gets older. And if you stop and think about it, do you guys have an older relative in your family that don't like to drive after dark? I'm kind of getting that way sometimes. And, it's, it, you know, it, you know I, I mean, there was a sweet lady in our church, and she quit coming to choir, particularly in the winter, because it's dark at 630. Do you know if we lived back in the Dallas area, they're still on the same time. It's dark at 530. And, that, you know, I'm like, my sister-in-law comes out here, and she's always like, it's so light out here so late in the day. But so think about how when as we get older, as there's less light, we don't see as well. We become afraid of things. That that happens to older people. You know, that's why you have to go pick up Granny and take her wherever you're going to take her, or Mima, or whatever you call her, Peepa. Now, Peepa still likes to drive. He can't see the road, but he still likes to drive, right? So those are associated with the conscious mind, the rational, and then the stages of life. So watch how often a story begins at daybreak and maybe somebody dies um, at midnight. Think about that. There's very typical things that go on. So the next one we're going to talk about, though, is the moon. So what metal, M-E-T-A-L, would we associate with the moon? I mean, it, when the sun reflects off of the moon, it does give a light. Um, silver? That's right, silver. That's right. So think about it. The opposite, silver and gold. All right, so as the sun is associated with the male, the moon is associated with female. And it's for that very obvious reason. The moon has cycles just like women do, okay? And, and so instead of being associated with the sun is the rational mind, the moon is associated more with the unconscious mind or actually the intuitive because we think of women as being very intuitive. Men think A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 1, 2, 3, 4. Women will go A, X, G, B, M, Q. We, we don't think, and I'm talking stereotypically, because there's a lot of women who are very rational in their thinking. But, but we can make a jump, an intuitive jump, from one point to the next. Guys have to work it all out, as typically is what it does. So it's associated with the female. Um, there's a science fan, uh, a fantasy author named Piers Anthony, and he wrote a series of books, and it's about a place called Zant, X-A-N-T-H. And Zant very much resembles Florida. That's where Anthony lived. And the very first book he wrote was called A Spell for Chameleon. Chameleon is a woman, and this and this is a land, Zant is a land of magic, and the it's been a long time since I read this book, but it, it impressed me because Chameleon is a woman and she, she is tied to the cycle of the moon. So as the moon becomes, as it approaches full, she becomes her most beautiful, but her most stupid. And as it moves into the time of no moon, she becomes less attractive, but incredibly intelligent. So for her, when there's a half moon, she's at her best. She's a common, she's, fairly smart and she's okay looking but it's about part of the issues that this woman has it was a very intriguing thing to do for a male author to tie a woman to that okay so it's 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 an interesting story and he's done some interesting things and uh it's amazing that this this fantasy land is basically florida but why not you can do that when you write fantasy but it's an intriguing notion that and men forever have tied women to to the moon. And if you stop and think about it, when the moon's out, do you see super well? It, I mean, you can see, but it's not as clear as it is in the daylight, unless there's a really good full moon, or that super moon when it's closer than it normally is, and we've got a, another one that just happened, or is getting set to happen. But you, if you think about the light, this, the, the old song was, by the light of the silvery moon. I'll want a spoon to my honey I'll croon love to. And so it's become associated with the feminine, with romantic, things like that. And so a full moon would be where at the time you have the most light, but it's also mysterious. So think about how it only comes out at night. It reflects the sun's light. So it also gives that moon the subservient position to the sun. The sun is the male, so it reinforces that the male is dominant, the female is weaker. So, so see how often things happen in a full moon. And what else happens in a full moon? 
werewolves come out, right? <laughs> That's when they become, you know, because, um, so, and if you look at all the words that are associated with werewolf, lupin, and things like that, they're all based off of loon, the, the Greek term for moon. So, because that's what they think. And, you know, and so think about it. And so um, I also read another book. It was, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of my joy. I can think of the name. Uh, Black Moon, Red Sun, something along those lines. So, But it's very intriguing when you stop and think about it. So lots of things happen at night, and so it's also unconscious and the intuitive. So that's what the moon is. The next thing I want to talk about are serpents, snakes. There are signs we associate serpents and snakes with the devil. Right? Because that's what he used to uh, suborn Eve, who then suborned Adam. Okay? In other words, tempted them. Um, the snake sheds its skin, so it's also a symbol of renewal. Um, in Harry Potter, the prisoner, no, Chamber of Secrets, what is the basilisk but a big snake? Yeah. And its skin is laying in there. Um, okay, snakes are associated with sexuality. And the unconscious mind, okay? Now, the reason for sexuality is what is the shape of a snake? <laughs> Symbolism. I, okay, and this is, this is always the tough one for me to talk about. When you, what sells tickets at movies? I feel, it seems like I'm going off track. Violence and sex. And sex. Mm -hmm. Those are very important drives in the human psyche. So when you read poetry, when you read literature, when you uh, watch a movie or watch TV, how often do those things come up? So for me to not talk about consider sex as showing up in literature would be silly. Um, and this is a college class. Now, I'm not going to sit there and use vulgar language, but if something is shaped like, <laughs> then it's representative of it, okay? I, I didn't even say the word out loud. So it, have y'all seen Austin Powers? The very first one, and he's wandering around, and he talks about the twigs and the berries, or the berries and the twig, and he's carrying, they're carrying the cantaloupes and the banana and all that. If it's shaped like something, it's symbolic of it. There's a crazy, there's a phrase that they have for older men. Oh. Um, I got a new phone. I got a new phone and a new phone case that you can actually see my grandson, <laughs> my soon-to-be new grandson, and my son. Uh, there's a term called middle-aged crazy, and it's where um, they actually made a movie about it, but it's where men hit a certain age, and they begin to worry about the loss of their sexuality, you know, because they're getting older. Their hair's growing up, you know. Things start to sag. Hey, it happens to women, too. And so what do men tend to do when they go middle-aged crazy? They divorce their wives, and they go out and they look for young girls because it makes them feel younger. And what do they buy? What kind of car do they buy? They buy a sports car. What's the shape of a sports car? It's fast and it's powerful. It becomes symbolic of their sexuality. Okay? Well, you know, so watch how often, see how often old men are driving hot cars. You know? It's not the young men because they can't afford them and they can't handle the insurance. It's old men. Okay? Um, and then the other, the other thing I want to bring up, have you ever seen the pickup trucks and they've got those little things, silver balls hanging off the back end? I had not seen that until about. They make them for bikes now, too. They make them for bikes. Yeah. Okay, so I, and we know what they're representative of. It's, it's a man's masculinity. But my point is when you hang these little tiny silver balls off of the back end of this big old pickup truck, <laughs> then that means that it's time, that if you got these little, there's not a correlation because size is important, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's all. I, you see where I'm going with that? I, I don't want to be vulgar, but that's kind of what we've got to get across is that guys associate size with sexuality. It's just what it does, okay? And so, and because sex is such a powerful drive in the human psyche, um, it also becomes part of the unconscious mind. We do have those kind of dreams when, when we're unconscious, okay? And that's not surprising. It's an important drive. It's, it's that sexual drive is what keeps the human race being born, okay? That's just what, how it goes out there. So, so stop and think about it, you know. So if you see a lot of snakes in a movie, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all representative of that. But, you know, there's this whole evil thing going on, and that's serpents. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, trees. Trees are green, so they are signs of life. Uh, they're important. 
I got a text message from the lady. She's asking me another question, but I'm not, I'll have to answer it after we get done. There are signs of life. And so when you think about, when you see a tree mentioned, you should think about the one tree, the very first tree. That's the tree of knowledge, okay? And this tree is very important. And, it's, it, and the eating of the fruit off of that tree are what led to people, uh, mankind. And when, when we're talking about symbolism, we're talking about Western civilization, okay? We're not necessarily talking. Asians have a different, different um, literary background and historical background. So we're talking about Western civilization. Um, so we think about the one tree. So a single tree, when there's a story about a single tree, you should be, that should make you think of an illusion, the biblical illusion uh, to the tree of the knowledge of, um, tree of knowledge. It's not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's the tree of knowledge. It's what you do with that knowledge that makes it good or evil. Um, so a single tree, that's what it's about. So now when you're talking about a forest, a forest is a bunch of trees, right? And so if you've seen any of The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, when you get all those trees together, you can't see the sun. So the tree, a forest becomes symbolic of the unconscious mind because it crowds out the sun. It's dark in there. And I just used the example of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings because the movies were so effective when they're doing Markwood and a couple of the other forests. But what I want to talk about, though, is that um, think about Europe in the year 1620, when the pilgrims come over. Europe is pretty much settled. I mean, there's some big stands of forest, but everything's controlled, right? And man has had control of it. So when those pilgrims get on those first ships and those first explorers and they come over to the New World, and what do they see? But they see this vast countryside, and it's covered with trees. And you, can, and you go out there, and in those trees are these people that don't look like you. Their skin is a different color. There's animals that you've never seen before. So they were frightened of it when they get to the New World. And so what do they do? They cut down the trees. And they use the trees to build forts and that to barricade themselves away from that forest, that natural thing that they cannot control. So really, um, anything where man starts building and doing things like that, like a garden, which is the next one, that's man's attempt to control nature, to keep nature from frightening him. So when they came out here, they were just totally freaked out by all those trees and those animals. And then as they crossed and got into the Great Plains, it was frightening again because you could see so far and there was just nothing there. Um, it took a special breed of person to move across the middle continent of the, in the middle of the continent um, because here they had all the trees. They kind of knew what was going on. And then you've got all this open space. Personally, I've lived out here for a long time. I went to college at Tech and then I lived in Houston. And then I came back out here. The next time I went to Houston, I didn't like Houston. I couldn't see the sky. I'm used to being able to see the sky as far as I can. So I guess I like the rational mind. Um, whereas when you get under those trees, you can't see. You can't tell where your weather's coming from. We know what our weather's going to be. A lot of times it hits us in the face. <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, so stop and think about those things. And again, any time where you can't see clearly, it's the unconscious mind. So garden then like the Garden of Eden becomes the symbolic of the rational mind and it's man's attempt to control nature. So this considered a positive thing, a garden is, whereas a forest is considered negative in a sense. Not that we have the opportunity to go in a lot of forests over here, but we lived in Alaska when I was little and out in the country, um, outside of Anchorage, and my parents would allow us to wander around out there. It was amazing. And there were trees. And, you know, they, they weren't too worried about us. But then you only had to worry about the animals and not the people quite so much back then. But that's trees. But they're symbolic of life. Um, and so take a trees as being kind of representative of nature. And nature, man's afraid of nature. We can't control it. But, you know, they're sitting there talking about the second time this year that the Houston area has had snow. Have we had any? In reality, we've had no snow. But they've had more snow than we have this winter. And it's down in Florida again and in Alabama. They're showing, they don't, and we think our people don't know how to drive on snow. They're even worse off than we are. So man's attempt to control nature is almost pointless. We're never going to control weather. It's going to be one of those crazy things. All right, so that's trees. Um, the desert, the desert is the domain of the conscious because there aren't a lot of trees. You can see the sun. There's this whole notion. So it's the rational mind, the uh, conscious mind, the coming to understanding. You find clarity out there. And if you stop and think about, about it, 
And I'm going to talk about a very important symbol. Is um, What does Jesus do? He goes out into the desert for 40 days to go out there and come to terms to find out exactly what he's going to be doing with his ministry. That's what he does. So that's what the desert is. And the desert is important because out of the desert, we get the three great monotheistic religions. Do you know what monotheistic means? It means single God, one God. And that's Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Whoa, that went backwards. Back. I didn't really want that to happen. Let's see, back arrow. There we go. I thought I had, I guess my picture is not on there anymore. Um, but monotheistic, think about it. One God comes from the desert. When you go and you look at India and Japan and the very tropical areas, South America, the equatorial areas, multiple gods because of all that dark, you know, they, they made them up. I mean, if you look at Europe, I mean, Italy's not a desert. You had the Greeks and the, and the Romans, so, in Greece. So that's what's kind of interesting. But they're all directly related. Those monotheistic religions are very important because they've dominated, you know. You have Judaism, then Islam, and then Christianity. So, and, and it's interesting that they came out of the desert. All right? So then we're going to talk about journey. We kind of went over that a little bit, but a journey then, it's not necessarily about how you, about getting from one place to another. Does anybody, I'm going to stop for a second, anybody ever watch Avatar The Last Airbender? Not Avatar The Blue People, okay? Avatar The Last Airbender with Aang and Sokka and Katara. Okay, it, it may be scary. I know it all. I got, I don't know what happened 10 years or so or more ago. It was on TV, and I'd go, it'd go year ones, and I was like, what's going on? And so I became intrigued enough that I asked my son to buy me the DVDs. <laughs> and so if you're talking symbolism, you talk Avatar The Last Airbender because they're so associated with all those things. But that's a long journey. Growth and change are what's important. It's what's happening inside. And so there's a growth and change over those kids. Did you watch the new one? The Cora. Cora, yeah, yeah Cora was different and yeah. very and kind of inter interesting how it yeah. ended. Um, yeah, and it, so it's that kind of thing, but it's they're very symbolic little stories. And I don't know if I'm going to go see the new Avatar that's coming out with the blue aliens. They're making another. Yeah, one. they're making another one. <laughs> so, but I do plan. Um, I do plan on. Uh, I'll probably go see it. Uh, but anyway, journeys are about growth and change. It's not necessarily. Uh, the, one of the stories is about Sokka wants to get somewhere, and the guy said it's not about it's not about getting somewhere; it's about how you get there and what happens as you get there. So it's the journey is is important in and of itself. Uh, well, it's about what happens inside, and a lot of times it involves a quest or goal. Luke Skywalker doesn't leave Tatooine unless R two D two says, "Help me, Obi Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope." He gets that message, and that sends him off on a on the on the quest or the goal. Harry Potter's quest or goal. He finds out that he's a wizard. And so his quest or goal, though, becomes defeating Voldemort. Mm -hmm. And by the way, what does Voldemort look like but a snake? Yeah. Okay. What does he control? Snakes. Snakes, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so you can see how um, that. Now, one of the things I was, I'm just briefly going to go back, and we may have to come back to this some more later on. Oh, we're almost out of time. Is that um, George Lucas had a gentleman named Joseph Campbell live with him. Joseph Campbell wrote a book called uh, The Myth of the Hero. And so uh, when you watch Star Wars, there's very classic traits of a hero. And one of them is that he has a mysterious origin, which means he might be descended from the god or gods. Mm -hmm. Luke has a mysterious origin. Anakin has a mysterious origin. They, and Ray has a mysterious origin. So it's not just this silly thing about people shooting things in outer space. There's a lot of literary and cultural background that's gone into Star Wars. And trying to keep true to that's what's kind of going on with the, the final series in it, okay? So you think about the hero, there are very set patterns of characters in literature, and you can go, there's the hero, there's the old mother, there's the crown, where there's the crown, the mother, there's the virgin, um, there are disciples or followers that come after him. So, you know, what I'd like you to do is if you're not a science fiction fan, Stop and go think about it. Just take away the setting and see if you can realize that there may be more to that than you think. It's just, you know, letting, fantasy is the same way. The characters, their heroes, they all fit. So that's a very quick version. We didn't get through much. I'll try to cover some more. So
So for Monday, you need to read a Rose Friendly. You do have Connect assignments. Your Connect code should work good. All right, and if you did the free preview, try different passwords. You might be able to use